going to uh, now kind of hand it over to the panel to introduce themselves. So we'll just go in order here, starting with Mary. Hi, everyone. I'm Mary Mahoney. Um, so I am a intern. Uh, so I went to med school at SUNY Upstate in Syracuse. Um, and then I'm an intern right now at a small little community hospital back home. So I'm literally in my parents' house right now, but I'm saving a lot of money, which is nice. Um, I'm in a transitional year. And then I'm going to Fox Chase for radiation oncology afterwards, which I'm super excited about. Hi, Mary. And hi there, I'm Trevor. I went to med school at the University of Utah uh, with Dr. Hutton here when he was a, a resident. And I matched to the University of Wisconsin. So they have a combined intern year option. And so I'm also here for intern year, which is uh, convenient. And yeah, it's been great so far. Hey everyone, I'm Michael Shad. Um, I did my med school at the University of Pittsburgh and I matched into the University of Pennsylvania, which as many of you know is a categorical program. So I'm doing my intern year here at the University of Pennsylvania. Nice to meet you all. So I think the best way to do this uh, will be uh, use the Q&A function at the bottom to type in questions and then we'll try to get through as many of them as possible. Um, <clears throat> While we're waiting for questions to trickle in, do you guys want to uh, just kind of reflect on the first uh, month or two of intern year uh, and how that transition has been for you? I guess I'll say um, I was, I don't know, I was probably pretty nervous in general because uh, I feel like there's a lot of things that I didn't feel prepared for it, but it's been a lot easier transition than I was expecting. And it's been a pleasant surprise so far. Yeah, I, it's a, it's, it's a big transition, but your med school prepares you well for, for intern year. And, um, you know, I, I can only speak to my own program. It's, it's been nice to get to know the hospital, um, and where I'm going to be practicing radiation oncology. I know, you know, Trevor's having a similar experience. Um, so it's been nice to kind of just get to Philly and, and get situated. Um, and I really like my program. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a transition like anything else. I mean, you know, when you first got to med school, you're like, how do people do this? And then, you know, you did it and then you started your clerkships and you're like, how do people do this? And then they did it. So sort of like that. I mean, everyone goes through it. Um, I don't know. My PD was also just like very nice and upfront. He's like, you know, you guys are doctors, but with deficiencies, that's okay. Like we know that that's why you're supervised. And like, you really do see like kind of like the Swiss cheese mall, right? Like you're the slice of cheese with like a giant hole, but then throughout residency, like, you know, you become more cheese and less whole. And then you have other cheese, you know, you have your attending, you have your pharmacist, you have your senior residents, you have your other co-interns. So like, even if you feel like you have gaping knowledge and your whole, like, it will fill over time, but know that there's people around you to support you. So it's not just like thrown into everything. I literally started on ICU um, after not doing clinical medicine for a year. So it was very rough, but again, everyone kind of got through it because it's like structured in a way that, you know, for everyone's safety. There's a question in the chat from Keldon um, asking for advice about identifying programs that will prepare you best for residency. Do you guys have any thoughts on how you kind of uh, figured that out when you were interviewing at prelim and intern year programs? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> my personal stance on this is that almost all places will prepare you well for um, a residency in radius oncology. And um, the reason that I feel qualified to say that is not because I've personally had that experience myself, because we all um, of course, like are not Radonc residents yet, so we can't really reflect back on the prep that was given to us during our prelim year. But in speaking to radiation oncology residents at different programs and hearing people who did programs with more or less oncology and asking them, do you feel that since you had more oncology during your uh, prelim or TY that you feel more prepared than your co-residents? Most of them actually said they didn't feel like there was a significant difference. Um, so I kind of feel like go where makes sense for you for this year. Um, 
there's, I think, pros and cons for everyone. Sometimes people like to stay in the same city they're in. Sometimes people like to go to the city where they're going to be uh, at their residency and uh, try, try to do that and, and try to get uh, situated there. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, don't worry too much about programs adequately preparing you for your wrap-on presidency. I think that that's, that's going to happen at pretty much every program. Yeah, I can comment a little more on the second part of that, but I, I completely agree. I feel like the skills that transfer are like organization and time management and how to like control stress, how to like depend on the people around you, the like radiation oncology knowledge, like you're not going to get much of it during intern year and that's completely okay. And that's the expectation that's for PGY2 year. Um, so yeah, go where you think you'll be happy for a year. Um, probably the best advice Mike said there. Uh, there's another question a few people asked about kind of how many programs you applied to for prelim and TY. Um, looks like Mary answered in the chat, but uh, 22. Trevor or Mike, do you have a significantly different answer to that? A little more for me. I think I was in the range of 25 to 30. I probably applied to even more than that, more like 30 to 35. But It sort of depends, I feel like, on what your goals are. And I was potentially sort of didn't know, we didn't necessarily know we were where we were going to go geographically. But if you have like a home program that pretty much always takes graduates and you're really feel like you want to go there, then maybe you can apply to less. Um, but I reached out to my med school advisor um, who knew me and what I wanted and my application packet and had him advise me on how many to apply to. That was a good resource for me personally. Yeah, and I mean, like also, like again, like there's no like magic number, unfortunately we can give you. So, I mean, using, you know, your school's resources is very helpful because, you know, this isn't their first rodeo. Um, Cause at the end of the day too, it's not just rat on, there's derm people, radiology people, like a lot of other people in your class or the class above you, like has kind of encountered this. And I don't think it's just unique to like rat on. So I would definitely like rely on those resources. Also like, you know, if you have like an AOA or something or you have like a residency. So like trying to get some of that pure, even if like you feel a little isolated because you're a rat on applicant, remember that like, if you put all of you guys together, everyone that needs a prelim year, it's actually quite a lot of specialties. So don't kind of feel isolated by that. And then kind of like foreshadowing a little bit for uh, radium, we will kind of look a little bit at some of like the ERAS data that's available as well to kind of help answer that question. Cause I had that same question when I was going through it last year. So I'm a little like passionate about getting to the bottom of it, but I'm not quite there. So all, all I can tell you is sort of like our experiences, which are valuable too, but we're working on kind of getting you a more concrete answer as well. There's a question in the uh, Q&A about away rotations and how to prepare for them, um, which I think is a great question. Uh, and I would add to that kind of, how did you use those to get your foot in the door, kind of feel out programs more than you could during interview season, which I think is a huge challenge sometimes. Yeah, I think away rotations, to, to touch on the second part of the question, I think away rotations are truly the best way to get to know a program. So I sat and hummed and hawed for a while uh, before I picked my two away rotations. I picked Penn and MD Anderson. Um, and that was the best experience, going to the, these places, spending time with the residents and, and seeing how they um, really like the program and what's like there. There's really uh, no better experience to get to know a program. And then, um, of course, uh, if you, you know, fit in well with that program when you're on in a way, then it really helps come, come interview season. Um, for me personally, I'm definitely a preparer when it comes to, uh, you know, things like this. So I did a good amount of prep. I did um, uh, the... There's a Rover series of lectures um, that have like the basics of radiotherapy. Um, I did those, I made Anki cards on them. Um, and so I knew kind of the basics of the physics and whatnot that I could kind of pull out on away rotations. And that always uh, was a nice little trick. Um, and then there's also a um, textbook. Uh, I think it's like Essentials of Radiation Oncology or something like that. Each chapter 
is a specific disease site. And I would know which I knew which sites I was going to rotate on at these aways. It depends on where you choose. Some places you'll rotate on a different disease site, like every few days. Um, whereas Penn and MD Anderson was more consistent. Penn was one disease site the whole time. You got to know an attending um, really well throughout that time. MD Anderson was two different ones, but I would read the chapters uh, before um, going to uh, starting on those away rotations. And that, that was super helpful for me. You got to know some of the trials and that kind of thing. I think Michael touched on a reason why always are valuable is to get to know a program. And I, I would agree that's definitely the best way. Something else that I wasn't expecting in a way would benefit me for was it was actually really helpful during interview season. Um, it seems like programs were interested in knowing what aspects of programs I was looking for and having exposure to multiple programs helped me be better informed about how to answer that question. And so I think it helped me during interview season to be more prepared. Um, and then I would just agree um, that any prep for in a way rotation, I think probably the most helpful was just knowing what resources I was going to be using to look up ahead of time, like like the essentials book. The, and um, because there's just so much to know that you can't possibly prepare a coherent plan unless you have a source of the distilled knowledge from somewhere. So having that at a time was definitely helpful. I'll also just say a plug too that, you know, you're going to be entering a very expensive phase of medical school. So don't definitely like only do a ways if you feel like you would really gain something from them. Don't just do it because everyone seems to be doing it. And like, you're like, oh my God, I got to do like four or five. Like it can get very expensive. I mean, you know, obviously there's resources and a lot of programs too may also have scholarships as well. So don't just let the financials like limit you, but at the same time, like it is very like good to be cognizant of it too, and not just do it for the sake of doing it. So if you're interested in a program, applying there for residency, you really want to learn more about it, or you think it'd be a really enriching um, experience too, because remember, this is still like kind of the last year of your medical training. So like, let's say you can go to a center that has protons and your home program doesn't, that's still a very valuable experience. And then even having a life experience too, maybe you're really interested in you know, a lot of programs, like for me, when I chose MD Anderson, like there was other programs sort of in the South I was very interested in applying to, but I've never been to the South before, especially in the middle of summer. So it was like also very helpful just as like a life experience. And then, you know, there's a lot of programs in New York City I was interested in applying to. And even though I'm from like upstate New York, you know, that doesn't translate to being in New York City. So kind of like just getting used to city living and trying it out for four weeks versus having to be doing it for four years. There's also other, I think, other parts of a ways that's not always like talked about as well. And the last thing I'll say too, for a ways that I didn't realize until I like literally was on my second away is sometimes institutions have different ways of treating things. Um, and also just like the bureaucracy of it all. <laughs> so I didn't realize that rat could play space ours until I was on my second away. Um, Cause you know, I just at upstate, they just don't, the urologist does it because of like a billing reason. So, you know, I felt like really stupid when I was standing in the OR at Mount Sinai being like, oh, where's the urologist? And then the rat just started doing it. I'm like, oh, we can do that. I didn't know that. So, you know, just realize there's a lot that you can learn from a ways, not just like the nitty gritty rat on, because you will learn that in your residency, but there's other things that they can add value to, um, but realizing that they can be very expensive as well. So, you know, do that accordingly, because you're going to be paying a lot, as I'm sure you are, you're well aware of ERAS, um, all those charges that are coming up, and that's just the beginning. One other, I guess, tidbit of advice, it's never wrong to check in with a resident before you're going to go talk to a patient or present someone to faculty. I think most residents are more than happy to help talk you through whatever especially if you've done some prep, it, it can only make you look good. If you're like thinking of good questions or like, I can't decide which way to treat this. And so that's a good, easy way to kind of get a sanity check without looking stupid. Uh, there's another kind of similar question about preparing for interviews. Uh, so kind of building on the away rotation question, how did you guys prep? Like say, say tomorrow's an interview at institution A, did you have like a routine that you would run through or, or how'd you go about that? Sure, I can start. So I had, um, you know, I kind of prepared generally for interview questions. So um, I looked up common interview questions that you'd get asked um, and I sort of like went through those and thought about how I might answer those. You know, you should know 
your standard answer to what do you do to radiation oncology, um, those kinds of things. And then I'd look at like, you know, things for that institution specifically. So why am I interested in that institution? And then finally, I would look up my interviewers. Um, typically you get um, for almost all the, the places I interviewed, uh, perhaps all of them, I got a schedule of the specific radiation oncologist that I was going to meet with. And I would look them up in advance and just kind of see, like, I would just mark down the disease site, um, maybe something that I saw, like a common interest, uh, we'd gone to the same undergrad, um, or we'd done some similar research, then, then I would, you know, mark that down. And I thought that was helpful as a kind of like a, a conversation starter. I agree with all those points. Um, I think probably some of my most helpful interview prep in general was uh, coming up with a list of meaningful experiences I had through medical school, whether clinical or not, just to be able to apply to any questions that got asked. Um, so I didn't feel like I had to, um, you know, take a while to come up with a good answer. But um, I, I really like what Michael said about knowing just a little bit about your interviewers so that you're not caught off guard. You're, you're not asking like irrelevant questions to attendings who treat different disease sites or you're, you're talking about uh, your home program when you find out that, that attending went to that, went to your program or something like that. You know, you can just steer clear and go in it more confident. And I'll give a little life hack to always go to the pre-dinner with the residents because sometimes you'll get really good information. A, about like, they might tell you what kind of questions they're going to ask. So that's very nice. <laughs> but B, also too, they'll kind of give you like some of the strengths and like what makes a program unique. And you can kind of see like what gets them really passionate. And you can kind of reiterate that during your interview as well. So that's like kind of like a cheat where it's like you get to network with residents and learn about the program, but then you're also kind of preparing for your interview at the same time. And it kind of gets you into like that mindset. So I always went to them like whenever possible before, because it was just so helpful to kind of like get me ready to like talk to that program by like talking to the residents the night before. So highly recommend those sessions if you can go. Yeah, definitely go to the dinner the night before if you can. There's another question in here about imposter syndrome during residency application season, which, uh, spoiler alert, it does not go away ever, but how did you guys deal with that? Uh, or how are you dealing with that as new interns? I mean, I don't know. Everyone's a superstar. So it's kind of hard. Like you realize, oh my God, like this person's like super published and everything, but realize like you're there for a reason, you know, like they went through your application and like, they see something in you. So even like you, it is always hard to like not compare yourself to other people. Cause remember, like we're all very exceptional um, people. So just kind of realize that they picked you for a reason and that you have certain strengths and you have like certain experiences that make you unique and really like hone in on that too, like what you can give to the program. Yeah, I think it's kind of it's kind of interesting, like applying to a field that you don't get a ton of exposure to in medical school, because I think sometimes it can feel like, well, I'm going to be a radiation oncologist, but, you know, so little of my medical school has focused on the education of radiation oncology. And I think that that can kind of like engender some imposter syndrome. But um, just remember that that's natural um, and that, you know, you all um, are, are there for good reason. Um, and it's an amazing field and you should be excited to, to be applying and, you know, so, um, try not to let it get to you too much. Another kind of similar question. I feel like, uh, one of the hardest things during intern year, especially if you're at a, a busier, more intense program is just how to stay sane. Have you guys figured out any good routines for like winding down at the end of a terrible wards or ICU day? Because uh, I think that's super important uh, for intern year. Yeah, I think that's different for everyone. Um, but you know, you yeah, you can't do everything during intern year. You can't do all of your hobbies, and you know, like visit all of your friends and all, you know, you can't do everything. So you kind of have to pick the things that are the most important at the end of the day, whether that's like exercising, whether that's spending time with friends for me, it's spending time with my wife. 
um, and just like you know, relaxing and, and having quality time together. Um, and then make the most of the the times that you have on on outpatient and the and the vacation blocks that you get, um, and you know do, do things for yourself. Um, but it's you know in the end it is thankfully you know only one year for us, and so there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, I'll reiterate with Mike again. Like, it just seems like you're going to engineer and you're going to have no time to do anything. But you know, you do adjust, and then you get faster and more efficient. Like, even ICU when I felt like I was drowning, like you know, the days did end at some point, <laughs> even after 14 hours. And you know, I still had time to do my three minute. I got like a facial like light mass thing, like that thing from TikTok. So you bet believe like I still made my three minutes every day. I'm like, I have time to brush my teeth. I have time to do my three minute like face mask thing. So. So then it's also just like, you know, realizing that like you still have time in the day too, even if you're working and you're exhausted, like you still have time to like brush your teeth and do basic things. So if there's like something that gives you like a little bit of sanity or me time, like that's less than 10 minutes, you can probably still do it. Um, but I don't know. It's only been a month, so I'll have to see how good my skin looks at the end of the year. But I was still pretty proud of myself for doing it. <laughs> so far, really great results. Oh, thank you. you. Yeah, that three minute, yeah. you know, red light collagen. Let's go. I look like Jason when I have it on. It's like really spooky. <laughs> I guess I'd say too that it's not all inpatient medicine. It, you know, there's a lot of outpatient weekends sprinkled in between. And so we've all done it in third year and, you know, survived that. And so it's doable during intern year too. And I think it's also even better because you're in the loop and oriented and you have a a job and a place. So it's it's more fulfilling too, which makes the the long hours worth it. And I feel less of a need to um recover than I even did during third year. So I think you guys probably all did completely virtual interviews for this uh correct me if i'm wrong but do you have any tips for navigating uh that and zoom burnout and how you stay on over and over for all these zoom meetings yeah i'll say one of the best advice oh sorry mike i don't want to put you off but one of the best advice I got, um, and which is like so true, um, I think it was one of like the MDA residents that told me this. So I had the same question. I'm like, how do you like deal with all this like Zoom fatigue? And one of the things that she gave me that I found really helpful, she's like, just try to do something. Like, I know like we're always on our computers and always on our phones, but it's just like such a like a big break. She's like, try to go outside, try to go to the gym, but, like just try to do something that's not on your computer because you're going to be on your computer for so much, so frequently. So like, doing some like some hobby, especially if it does not involve a computer or a screen is like so good because it really will like refresh you. So like when it was nice, I mean, I'm in the Northeast. So, you know, we have like pretty tough winters, but you know, like when it was nicer out, like I would try like in between like my three hour, like meet and greets, whatever, like trying to go outside, get some fresh air or like, you know, cooking dinner, or, like and just listening to a podcast and not like looking at a screen was like huge. So like really like trying to be mindful and giving yourself screen breaks was like very huge and helpful for me. So I'd love to hear what everyone else's thoughts are. Yeah, I definitely agree with that advice. Um, I think like for me throughout the Zoom day, I mean, you do get Zoom fatigue and yeah. it's nice to have a little something that like helps perk you up. So for me, that was um, caffeine, like making sure I had, you know, enough coffee. And then I would also, <laughs> I'd also treat myself with a little square of chocolate before every single interview, <laughs> which I'll be like, put me in a good mood and like combat the Zoom fatigue. I highly, highly recommend it. Um, and then to, to talk about another aspect of things like the prep side of things to reduce the stress of Zoom fatigues. It's good to like get a good setup going, like make sure that you've got whatever audio visual stuff you want to get before your um, Zoom season starts, get good lighting, maybe like, you know, put a plant in the background or something. I was specifically told that by a program director, by the way, put a plant in the background. So um, take that advice if you want. Um, Is your plant still alive or did you come uh, I picked the fake plant and I had to tell that to him when I interviewed with him. Like, I am not responsible enough to keep a plant alive. I don't know what that says about me as a future resident, but. Oh, I'm surprised your cat didn't get to it too. Like you're just like talking yeah. to your cats. He only likes it. live plants. <laughs> okay, there you go. A lot um, of people commented on my plants in my background. So that's, you know, 
end of two at least. Yeah, but yeah, just just yeah, just wait, make sure you have everything set up. Yeah, no, well, it wasn't it wasn't this one. Yeah, but, have yeah. have fun backgrounds. Yeah. yeah. There's a few questions that kind of touch on the theme of like how to stay in touch if you did away rotations with that department or kind of how to, if, if you came across someone at a conference or whatever, just how to like maintain a connection in the downtime during interview season. Do you guys have any tips for that, making it as not awkward as possible? Yeah, so I mean, there's kind of two territories with here. The first thing I'll just like to say is like, first, just be careful about like communication with programs like post interview too, because that can get a little dicey. So it depends like why you're reaching out to them too. So if it's something related to like applications and stuff, just realize that there's like kind of like a different like rule set for that. But if it's like just related to like, hey, I'm doing like this research, like for example, I'm doing like a lot of like medical application, like research stuff right now. So I've actually been reaching out to like PDs that I like interviewed with, like most of them actually. So like, they're very nice people. So if you have their emails, like by all means, and then obviously we don't feel comfortable reaching out to like faculty, like residents are always good. And they're usually a safer bet, especially if you still have like, you want to do some post interview communication, the residents are usually good because they're not necessarily part of all that like calculus but i'd love to hear what kind of mike and trevor have about you know reaching out to pds and all the other stuff as well but i wanted to put that plug in there yeah i think there were three different like um avenues the one was was residents like mary said like i kept in touch with the residents um i a lot of them offered to help answer questions during interview season. And I definitely had questions during interview season. So um, like I reached out to them and stayed in contact with them that way. And then like asked them more questions about the program and that kind of stuff. Um, the other is updates for research. So if you like uh, publish something, um, I forget exactly, I forget what the general rule is, but I think it's like, if you um, get a publication accepted or something like that, then you can, I think different people have different, guidelines, but I think I use the, if a publication is accepted, you can update all of your programs. Um, I think I was typically sent to the program coordinator, um, but that sort of lets them know, hey, I'm still interested. Um, you know, I wanted to send you this update because I'm still like interested in interviewing with your program. Um, and then there's also like letters of interest, which are different than letters of intent. And that's like, you have to check on the, the communication policy, like Mary said, but Prior to interview invites getting sent out, um, some people would send letters saying, hey, like, by the way, to like the few programs that you're super interested in, hey, I'd really love the opportunity to interview at your program for X, Y, and Z. And I think that I'd be a good fit for these reasons. And um, yeah, so um, those are a few different options. People will also, if you absolutely know, like, whatever program is your top choice, you can email them to say that, but they can't really acknowledge it or reply. Uh, so it, it's a little bit weird, but uh, I know that that does happen and it's not breaking any rules as far as I'm aware. The yeah. one thing I'll say is do not do that if you're not ranking that program first, because it is a very small field and it's very easy to figure out if you lied <laughs> on that so yeah so I'll also say some programs will tell you not to do that like it's within your right as an app you're absolutely right I actually like read the like double like AMC rules like I really like went into the weeds here but uh, <laughs> so it is within your right to do it but some programs will literally that they're like please do not do that and it's probably not good form if they are very clear and they tell you not to do that and then you do that uh, so you know just be mindful but they'll make it like very clear like if they really don't want you like they'll be like hey, like, it'll be very clear. I'll just say that throughout the interview, like, you'll kind of, they'll make it extremely clear. And those are the letters of intent, by the way, the ones you send after all the interviews are over, hey, I'm ranking you, you know, number one or whatever. But again, like Mary said, some programs say don't send them. So you have to. Um, and now we're also talking for Radonk. When we're talking about interns, that's like a whole other can of worms. Little medicine, maybe. <laughs> but we're just yeah. saying, the, you know, where the big money is, which is radiation oncology, we're going to be spending most of your time, then yes. Uh, that's things get I'm oh, sorry yeah things get weird with all the interview communication with programs and like trying to wow each other and act interested but I, th I think you steer clear of a lot of trouble if you are always sincere about what you're saying and what you're intending 
once you guys interviewed, uh, did you reach out to anybody at your like home programs to help with rank lists if you were stuck or how did you kind of navigate the like, oh shoot, how do I compare all of these places? I know Trevor's answer because I think I was present for that. But. That's true. Yeah, <laughs> had a had a powwow with my home program a couple of times to get the lay of the land, and you know everyone knows everybody, so it's actually really helpful when that happens. Um, but I talked to a lot of residents on the phone for like a long time. It, I'm blown away with how generous a lot of residents are with their time, and um, it was that was really invaluable um with most programs that i ended up interviewing at or ranking highly i talked to the residents on the phone and um, that cleared a lot of things for me yeah i spoke with residents i also spoke with um uh uh two uh, attendings that had been kind of like mentors to me and um, long conversations with my wife too. And um, it took me a long time to eventually arrive at my final rank list. But, um, you know, I think thinking about it early is helpful. I also think ranking as you go is really helpful. So like I would rank, have an ongoing rank list. And each time I finished an interview, I'd place them while it was kind of in my memory within that rank list. Um, and that was really helpful come to the end, not to have to just have this blank sheet and then just put everything in. So I definitely recommend that. Yeah, I was probably the one who did like the least amount of like panicking about that. And I think that's kind of like twofold first, I guess I'm just like really aware of like things that I want and don't want, like things that are deal breakers for me, things that I can tolerate. So I think that helped a lot up front. Um, and then secondly, too, I think it is obviously like a big transition residency but remember you've made hard decisions before and I think sometimes people don't always like fully appreciate that right you had to decide where to go to undergrad you had to decide where to go to medical school so it's like at the end of the day it's just another decision like you have made these tough decisions in ways pros and cons before and then also look for trends within that too like I realize I'm someone I need to just sort of be in one place I don't do well when I have to be moved all around and that's what kind of turned me off for other med schools where clerkships were kind of throwing you to different states and I'm like I can't just like pick up and like be expected to perform 100% like I kind of need stability like stability was a really big thing for me so as I was looking around like some programs they send you on multiple ways or they have multiple different sites or you're driving around a lot and that sort of thing for me that like I knew that wouldn't work as well like not necessarily that that's a bad thing like for some people like that's okay but for me I'm like no I really want to be in one site not do that many away rotate like I can maybe like do one as long as it's like close but I don't want to kind of be like moving around like the state or having to go to another state to do my rotation so that's other things to think about like so think about you know like what trends have you kind of had throughout undergrad and medical school like what are like kind of big priorities for you too and you can also use that to help you as well kind of figure out like what's sort of like the best match for you and um, kind of bring insight to that as well. One of the best pieces of advice that was most helpful for me was at the end of every interview day, whether ad hoc or prelim or transition year, when you're exhausted from all the Zoom fatigue and just like want to go get a snack or whatever, don't leave. Just write a few sentences or a paragraph about your impressions, how you feel, and things that stuck out because everything does blend together. And it was like those those little paragraphs at the end that um, I, I based a lot of my decisions around. Like that. And yeah, just also go with your feelings. Like I know it's very cerebral, but then the day, like again, just trust your gut too. Like you'll know. I promise. Did any of you guys go to second look days to get more of a feel on places? Okay, so second looks. Um, so I'm kind of in the center of doing a huge research project on them. So I know way too much about second looks, but um, just as Mary, the applicant, yes, I went to two. Um, so both of them were in person. I got more offers, but I declined most of them. Um, 
So I, again, and this is where we're going to talk about like doing a ways and everything, like things can get really expensive very fast. You can get like very overwhelmed. Um, so never feel like even in this weird, like this was kind of like the first year, second looks were sort of like a thing more broad spectrum. I mean, they kind of popped up a little bit in 2021, but they were like really in full force when we were going through it, like from like zero to like a hundred for our cycle. So, um, kind of no one really knew what was going on. So that was fun. Um, but anyways, I picked it for programs that I was interested in, you know, learning more about. And I felt like, you know, I just kind of wanted to have the experience of doing a second look, being like, okay, what am I going to actually learn from this? Um, so I think for me personally, going through it, I don't think it really changed how I ranked any of my programs. But again, I'm just one person. I think also too, as you're going through interview seasons, it's so important to talk to different people because different people are going to have different reactions to different things. But from my personal experience, I felt like the virtual infrastructure was sufficient for me to learn everything about a program. So by the time I actually did a second look, it didn't really like change anything. Like I felt like I learned everything already. So if the second look wasn't an option, it would have not changed my rank list at all. Um, so that's just my experiences of that. Um, some of them can, you know, you're funding it yourself. So there's also financial situations as well. So that's also kind of dovetails into a little bit of the way rotations where, you know, it may be good to kind of talk to, you know, your med school, then also that program, see what kind of resources there is. Cause you definitely don't want to be like locked up opportunities just for financial reasons, but you also want to be smart about it too. Um, so hopefully, hopefully, hopefully we're going to have a paper out very soon. That's going to talk about second looks um, that you all can look at because there was nothing <laughs> when I was going through it. I'm like, wow, this is really bad. So we're working, we're working very hard to get some resources out for you guys. How did you guys, uh, so I think Mike and Trevor both said they didn't do second looks. So do you have any tips for uh, how you got a feel for the resident slash faculty culture in a Zoom room? It's not easy. I think that the dinner the night before was a good resource when it's kind of just the residents and you get to know them because they're the people, you know, you're going to be in their shoes specifically when you enter the program. Um, but, uh, you know, definitely always are, are the best way to do it. Um, and the places that offered second looks didn't end up being within my top few ranks. So that's why I chose not to go. Um, I didn't feel like they were going to ch change my kind of like top three ranks. Um, but conversations with places that I was really serious about, I had, um, conversations with residents. Um, so I'd reach out to residents and have like phone calls with them. And I felt like actually like even more so than just the dinner the night before one-on-one -on -one phone calls with residents um were for me i think the most accurate experience of getting a sense of what it'd be like to go there yeah every interview day without fail at the end of the like resident hour a bunch of residents would say if anyone has questions feel free to call me or text me or whatever and they'd give their phone numbers and so i'd write those down or their emails, and then they were all very happy to talk one on one. So I second that. And this might be obvious, but I'm just going to say it out loud. But the because of the gap that transition year prelim year has, the basically half of the residency cohorts not going to overlap with you, and so there's not much incentive to cover up problems. So if you reach out to the PGY fours or fives, like you're going to get honest answers almost always, uh, which I think is a little different than some of your classmates going into other specialties where there's this incentive to, you know, fill the spots. Uh, so maybe reach out to the older residents for if, if there's things you want to hear more about. I think we got through most of the questions, uh, unless I'm skipping any. I'm just going to um, say, because there's two questions about a lot uh, in-person interviews. Um, I just sent an email, um, and if there's any program coordinators in here, but um, we'll ask the program coordinators if they'll send if they're having in-person interviews this year. We can try and collate a list on our website um, to the best of our ability um, to try and help with that.
Yeah, and I'll also say for the prelim stuff, I don't know if those are also going in person. I know at least for mine, like one of them offered an in-person, but they were like still mostly like exclusively virtual and then like maybe hybrid. So I also don't know like how the prelim situation's looking as well. Uh, Someone asked if dinners still happen with the virtual interviews and it looks like Nima answered it, but yes, there's almost always like an hour zoom call with residents the night before. So it really piles up your zoom calls, but that's the, the session that many of our panelists have alluded to where they get to talk to just residents. Sometimes they'll send you gift cards or whatever to like have a dinner, which maybe Mary's looking into. <clears throat> Um, well, if there's no more questions, we can probably wrap things up. Uh, so I just want to thank the three panelists taking time out of their intern year, which can be absolutely crazy. So thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, I think we have, yeah, I just wanted to highlight there is another uh, upcoming great panel uh, that's being put on by uh, Rover with ARS, the Radium Society. Um, so we have another opportunity for you to meet some residents and talk about the application process. So here's the info for that. Um, and there's a link to sign up. You can find it on Twitter as well. And there's a link on the Rover website um, for that. And then shout out to our upcoming Rover sessions here. Here's the calendar for this year. So we have some really cool um, topics kind of getting into some more uh, specific areas uh, that many of us find interesting in Radonk. So please, if you're interested, sign up and we will uh, cross paths with you all soon. Good luck with applications. And there's always videos on the River site if you wanna get more education. Yeah, and I'll just put in a plug for ARS. So we're working really hard. You guys had some great questions about the new ERAS too. So we're looking into that. So we'll be talking about everything that we can. So it's really going to be more of like nuts and bolts. Like we have, you know, resources, we have slideshows, like, so it's going to be a good one. So please come out if you can. Um, if not, it'll be recorded as well and post on the website so you all can view it later. But we'll kind of go into the nitty gritties too. All right. Thanks everyone. Good luck with applications. Nice to meet you all. Good luck.